we open your word this morning. We humbly come into your presence, asking, Lord, that you give us understanding, that you give us wisdom, and that you give us the passion to dwell into your revealed word. But especially, Lord, as we live in a world where skepticism keeps on the rising, we ask that you help us internalize that it's not seeing so we can believe, but it is believing so we can see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sometimes it is very hard not to have the mind of a skeptic. Sometimes life circumstances guide you into a non-believing behavior about anything in life. That was my case when I was about probably six years old. I, I had a wonderful family. I was living in Caracas, Venezuela, in, in the area called Quinta Crespo, which is, is almost in the downtown of the city. You can imagine a New York full of Latino people, like the only Venezuelans. That's, that's what Caracas is like. And, you know, it was, it was, I was just finished kindergarten, and I was so happy. I mean, we have pictures of my graduation from kindergarten, and it was just a nice experience. But my mother had gotten sick. She, she was very ill by the time I finished my kindergarten. And I remember she was on a wheelchair, and, uh, and the pictures you know, were taken with me sitting on her lap, uh, was she was, because she couldn't walk. She got really sick. So my parents decided to send me that summer in a vacation uh, with my aunt, who lived in another city about three hours uh, east of, of Caracas, called Valencia. So I was spent a vacation, it was a wonderful time, I played with my cousins, they took me to the pool, to different affairs, and it was just a nice vacation. But you know, by the end of the vacation, I was already tired being there, and I wanted to see my family again. So they took me, and when I came to our apartment, um, I found my father, but I didn't find my mother. So I asked my father, Where, where's mom? Uh, and my father told me, well, she actually left on a trip, but she'll be back. Don't worry, she'll be back. Oh, okay. So every time, every day since that day, I would stare at the door of this apartment on the eighth, uh, eighth floor in the city of Caracas, waiting for my mom to appear. And a week went by, a month went by, two months went by. A year went by, and she never showed up again. I never saw her again. And you know, it started to creep into my mind that perhaps what my dad told me was not the whole truth. Sometimes it is hard not to be a skeptic. And I go back to the story at the end of the sermon, so keep your, keep your ears open. But the story of today is precisely about the mind of a skeptic. So please open your Bibles with me in the Gospel according to John. According to John, Gospel according to John, or John chapter 20, verse 24. Again, John chapter 20, verse 24. 24. And this is really the story of somebody who was the extreme of being a skeptic. And the whole story starts this way in John chapter 20, verse 24. And it says, John tell narrates, one of the twelve, Thomas, called the twin, was not with the rest when Jesus came. Now, the story is referring to a previous appearance of Jesus after the crucifixion, after the resurrection. He came to the disciples, and John starts the story saying, and Thomas was not there. 
So we can think about when Thomas actually was there. He was there when Jesus was in that boat of Galilee and he raised his hand and said to the storm, be still. And he witnessed how the, the wave eventually became calmed down and when it was a storm, became a still, nice, big lake. He was there when he, uh, Jesus was surrounded by thousands of people and then they didn't have anything to eat so, so he got like bread and, and fish, but it was not enough, so he multiplied it. And he saw how two fishes and five loaves of bread started feeding thousands of people. He was there then. He was there when Jesus approached the tomb of Lazarus and yelled out, Lazarus, come forth. And he witnessed how Lazarus came out of the tomb. He was there. For three years, Thomas was there listening to Jesus' speeches, seeing the miracles, seeing the marvelous wonders that happened around him. He was there probably at the crucifixion. He saw what happened and how the, the whole sky turned into darkness, that huge earthquake and that voice that came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. He was there. But he was not there when Jesus appeared after the resurrection. So the, the narration continues, and John adds then that detail. You know, the disciples were excited to share with Thomas in verse 24, and they told Thomas, We have seen the Lord. Now you you, you would imagine. You know, the reaction that, 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 that you would expect is like, what? Are you serious? Really? Where is he? Oh, you would expect like, oh, I knew this was going to happen. Or, or, or just at least some kind of happiness. But instead, what we have is a very disrespectful, scandalous request by Thomas. This is how Thomas respond to this. We continue reading uh, in verse 25. And Thomas replied, so he said, unless I see the mark of the nails on his hands, unless I put my finger into the place where the nails were and my hand into his side, I will not believe it. Ooh. That is very serious. Because you see, in societies of shame and honor, where you value, what is highly value, is how you treat others. And there is nothing more disgraceful and shameful than actually humiliating somebody after death. Indeed, that's why they embalsamated the body. That's why they put perfumes on the body. So when you walk by the tombs, you wouldn't smell the body decomposing because that odor, odor would actually bring shame to the body who is actually dead. That, that, is, that is why, that's precisely why there is an expression in the Bible that indicates a punishment that is worth Worse than death, which is being cut off. Being cut off means that you made your name wouldn't even be remembered. That's why when Saul and, and his sons were killed in battle, the enemies took their bodies, put them on sticks, and displayed them precisely to humiliate them in the worst possible manner because. You can, you, you can go, you can humiliate somebody while they are alive, but if you want to go to a real extreme, oh, mock their dead body. That's why one time when we were excavating in Tel Jalul in central Jordan, that's one excavation Andrews does, 
You know, we wanted to excavate an area that is called the Acropolis. This is the area where the temples are and the cultic material. And we couldn't because they were using that as a modern type of cemetery. So when we tried to excavate there, the very next morning we found people with huge guns waiting for us. If you don't touch, you don't, you don't humiliate the dead body of our ancestors. Mm -mm -mm. So what Thomas was asking, literally, was the desecration of Jesus' body. He was really asking for an entire humiliation of Christ in a post-mortem state after death. Now, any other person would get angry about this. Anybody else, any relative would be really upset. But here's when it comes the beauty of the story, how Jesus responds to that particular humiliation. John continues narrating, and he adds to the story that a week later, about eight days after, in verse 26, his disciples were again in the room, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them, saying, Peace be unto you. Now, this is very interesting because you see, the Gnostics used to believe, the Gnostics used to believe that, uh, that there was a separation between the body and the soul. And, and you know, people could appear in a spiritual type of form. Indeed, when the disciples were in the stormy sea, when they saw Jesus walking on water, what, what did they, they scream out? We see a ghost. So yeah, that was perfect, you know. And Jesus appeared, the, the whole doors were closed, and he appears in a normal way, which the Gnostic would expect a person to appear. And then he stands in the midst of them and salutes and speaks be unto you. Then he directs his attention straight to Thomas. And then he says, Thomas, place your finger here in my hands. Reach your hand where, here and put it into my side. Be an apistos, a believer. Don't be an apistos. Don't become an apistos, an unbeliever, but a pistos, a believer. In other words, Jesus was willing to allow his disciple to desecrate his body, to humiliate him, to make sure that he did believe. Now think about the profound statement that Jesus is making. Throughout three years, Thomas, even though he saw so much evidence, he would not believe. But Jesus could not go to heaven. He could not leave this place until Thomas was saved. He could not depart until Thomas' heart was transformed from a skeptic into a believing disciple. And Jesus was willing to go to any extreme that was necessary, even in that implied the desecration of his own body. And you know, there is a lot of skepticism today that wants to put into doubt the biblical text. That it's not really God's words, it's not inspired. It's just a bunch of fairy tales put together, political, ancient propaganda. That's what you guys are going to hear in your college university. That's what you're going to hear your psychology professors. That's what you're going to hear most of the science professors that you have in your schools. 
that uh, the flood? Oh, that didn't happen. That's, that's just a fairy tale story. I mean, it's like believing in the Avengers. Give me a break. That, that story about creation? No, no. It's that, pff, that is just poor invention. It's actually just a poem that, that is there. However, I want to give you just a little bit of a taste of what most of these people do not take into account. Now, the Bible has been challenged in many ways. And one of the greater challenges that they have, which was this name, Belshazzar. As you guys know, Belshazzar appears in the book of Daniel as the king of no, not Persia, Babylon. Okay? He's the king of Babylon. Now, for many years, for many years, this was discarded just as a mythological figure because there was no evidence outside a scripture that verified the existence of any king of Babylon in the entire history named Belshazzar. There was no evidence whatsoever. But in 1860, excavations in the Sagila, in the temple of uh, Babylon, they discovered a, several, a, a group of texts that are now been called the Chronicle of Nabonidus, okay? the story of the records of a king named Nabonidus who was Belshazzar's father. Now, he appears everywhere, but now an idol does not appear in the biblical text who appears as Belshazzar. So for years, scholars used this particular reference to say, you see, the biblical text does not have re real historical validity. <coughs> ah. But when they discovered this cylinder, they realized that Nabonidus had a son. And in the Chronicles states that Nabonidus, this king of Babylon, because he was trying to conduct a religious reform towards the worship of the moon god seen in Babylon, and people didn't like that reform, he had to actually take refuge in an oasis in the Arabian desert called Tema. And he left in charge of the city uh, and his son, Belshazzar, who precisely was at the city rolling when the Persians came and attacked the city. So the skeptic said, there's no Belshazzar. There's no evidence for him. The Bible is wrong. But new discoveries confirmed the fact that the Bible had always been right, but the skeptics were wrong. Even further, these records disappear from the knowledge of the people until around 1860. So much that Josephus, the Jewish historian, he said that Belshazzar was another name for the same king Nabonidus in order to kind of deal in, a, in an apologetic, in a way of dealing with the critics. Nevertheless, this brings a very important point, my friends, young fellows. I want you to pay close attention to this. That means that only, but you need to think about this. After the Babylonian gets sacked by the Persian, this records cease to appear. That's the year 539 before Christ. And they don't appear again until 1860. So the only way, the only way Daniel could know about the existence of Belshazzar is if he was actually a contemporary of Belshazzar living in Babylon. But at that time, the Greek empire had not come into power. Indeed, at the time of the story of Daniel 6 and the visions in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, Babylonia was still the ruling power, not even the Middle Persians. So the only way a contemporary of Belshazzar 
could have known that in the future, the Middle Persians and the Greeks or the people of Javan, the people who speak the dialect from the Aegean Sea, will become an empire was through a direct revelation from God. So for the critics, you cannot have it both ways. But also, not only you have a ceiling of that one idols that tells that, what about King David, which we'll talk about after during lunch time? He's also been considered a mythological figure. Indeed, in 1994, they announced in professional meetings in Chicago, talking about the, the meetings that encloses all the archaeologists, theologians of the entire world, they announced the historical death of David and Solomon. Oh, but in 1993, in 1993, okay, by accident, by accident, okay, misplaced, they discover a fragment of a stila in the city of Dan, all the way north toward the Sea of Galilee. Okay, the, the main entrance towards the, what is called today Israel. And in this city, in, in Tel Dan, in the city of Dan, they discovered this stela, and in the stela there was a reference that said Melech Yisrael, king of Israel, and then added later the term Beyid David, house of David. But here's what is more interesting, that the stela was not written by an Israelite, it was written by the king of Damascus. So he's an enemy of Israel who is actually acknowledging the historical validity of a dynasty based upon the existence of a king, a founder of a dynasty named David. So again, the skeptics were wrong again. But then we have the idea of the Israel being a slave in Egypt. And while some people contest this idea, most critical scholars deny that that actually ever happened. You know, they, they point out that, well, that was, that's, just a, that's not a real story. Uh, there's no extra evidence for that. But recently, two scholars, okay, two, two critical scholars, by the way, were looking at several monuments in the Museum of Berlin, and they found a pedestal that dated to the 18th dynasty of Amenhotep II. You're talking about between um, 1504 and 1450 BC, okay, before Christ. And in it, it describes a bunch of nations, several nations that were enslaved by the Egyptians. And one of those cartouches, those little typical uh, things that you have different signs, one of them, uh, it reads precisely the name Yisrael or Israel. Now you have a monument dating to about the time of the Exodus, about 1450, that does classify a group of people, a group of nations, a ethnicity, being slaves in Egypt, named Israel. My dear friends, what about King Hezekiah? Most people said, oh, all the evidence that we have about King Hezekiah has been found like on outside of real careful excavations in the black market. Uh, you know, there's not anything that really supports the evidence that indeed Hezekiah was in Jerusalem. Ah, but another archaeologist, Massard, found in the Ophel, that's called the city of David, or the old Jerusalem, recently a seal that not only contains the name Hezekiah, but also names it as king of Israel. And on top of that, the, the study of the, of the, of the letters, this, this bullet, this official sign, signature to the 7th century, 8th to the 7th century, that means precisely the time at which the Bible says Hezekiah was king of Israel. But you also have outside records of Sennacherib, king of the Assyrians, with the prism, the hexagonal uh, record of Hezekiah's, I mean, Sennacherib's uh, 
campaign in, in the pale of Palestine. And you know, the Bible says, did the Bible say that Sennacherib was able to conquer Jerusalem? No, right? He wasn't able to conquer. Remember that episode in which Sennacherib shows up with his army and then blasts into Hezekiah and says, Oh, who's going to deliver you from my gods? Your gods are nothing. You know, look at what I've done to all the nations. And then Hezekiah in fear, because the Assyrians were not nice people. They like to use a lot of torture and instigate fear by doing things like cutting people's heads, burning their fields, torturing them, anything that would instigate fear so people would not rebel against them. And Hezekiah, knowing that fact, and knowing what they did to the city of Lachish, then he goes to God, and, he, and Isaiah comes and intervenes, and Lord, please deliver us. And in the Bible says that indeed they were delivered. In the, by the Sennacherib's point of view, in his record, he said that he caged Hezekiah in Jerusalem, but he never claims to have conquered the city. Even though he was a greater power. Once again, the Bible was accurate and the skeptics were wrong. Now there is enough evidence out there for you to believe or not believe. But this is not about seeing so you can believe it's about believing so you can see. Amen. And Jesus continues addressing Thomas. And then Thomas, when he sees Jesus face to face, then he claims in complete awe, amazement, and humbleness. How could you, how fails, my Lord, my God? Because Thomas knew exactly what he had just requested. And he knew that if Peter was God, he will send fire from heaven and burn him into ashes right there. He knew that if John was God, he would probably send a flood and drown him. He knew that if anybody else was God, they would probably cause the earth to open up and swallow him and close it down. Because you don't even respect me after my own death. So he knew what he asked. But he was shocked by what he received. Jesus says, come, desecrate me. And then Thomas, at that point, claimed in worship and full adoration, how could you, how fails, my Lord, my God. And then Jesus replies back with these kind words. Because you have seen me, you, in this version said, have found faith. Literally in Greek says, because you've seen me, you believe. You see the word pisteos. But then he lances a blessing. Happy are those, blessed are those, who have never seen, yet believe. You know who Jesus is talking about? You and me. Because just as Jesus would not depart to heaven without turning Thomas' heart towards believing, he will also would not spare any effort to make sure that your heart comes from a Apistels to a pistels, from an unbeliever to a believer. Even if that implies humiliating himself 
so you can believe. Because it's not about seeing so you can believe, but it's about believing so you can see. I was staring at that door every single day after my father told me that my mother had gone on a vacation. Years went by. And when I was older, I had a conversation with my father and said, what happened? And he told me the story. He said, when you were in kindergarten, your mother got sick of cancer, pancreas cancer. And she knew she was not going to last long. So what we decided as a couple, as your parents, was to send you off into a vacation so you wouldn't have to see your mother pass away. And we decided that to minimize your pain, we will tell you that she went on a trip instead of saying that she died. But even more, he told me, your mother, before she died, she was receiving Bible studies with the local pastor, in the, one of the pastors in the church. And she accepted Jesus in her heart. Now, she was so weak from the cancer that she, could, she wasn't baptized because she couldn't get up. I mean, there was, she was in a lot of pain. But she made sure before she passed away that you were registered in an Adventist school so you can receive the same hope that she received before she died. With the idea that when Jesus comes back, you could see her opening that door and entering and meeting you again. It is not about seeing so you can believe. But it's about believing with your heart so you can see what God will do with you. In my academic life, I'm surrounded by skepticals. People who trash the validity of the text who mock those who believe. But even from some of those most skeptic ones, in times of high stress, I've heard them say, please, if you believe, pray for me. I'm talking about William Deaver. My friends, Thomas did this scandalous request. Jesus conceded the request. As a result, Thomas turned his heart from an unbeliever to a believer. And then Jesus left these words for you. Happy or blessed are those who did not see and yet believe. Because it's not about seeing so you can believe, but it's about believing so you can see. So I want to encourage you this week. I want to encourage you this week. Some of you, young folks, older folks, experienced people, may have doubts. There might be circumstances in your life, we all have them, in which we question where is God? They probably things that happen in life that guide us into a mindset of an unbeliever. But at that point, I want you to kneel down and ask yourself, ask God anything, even if it's a scandalous request, and ask Him to show Himself to you and believe me 
he'll come, stand in front of you, and say, put your finger here, put your hand here. But do not have the heart of an unbeliever, but of a believer. And this week, I want you to really dwell into that thought. Look at the Bible, read the text, and find God's presence right there next to you. And memorize this phrase. It's not that I see so I can believe, but it's that I believe so I can see. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, as fragile, fleshly humans, we are weak. We, we find life to be very difficult, Lord. We are surrounded by many voices who are challenging the most basic aspects of our faith. Sometimes it's the ideas, sometimes it's the life circumstances, but there's always a moment in our life and we tend to question, is this really worthy? Is there a God out there looking at my pain? And in those moments, Lord, please appear to us just like you did with Thomas. Show yourself into our presence. Manifest yourself. Help us, Lord, that our hearts never turn to be unbelievers, but instead believers. And bless us with that fortitude, blessing that Jesus left. Blessed are those who did not see and yet believe. Remind us, Lord, that it's not so much about what I can prove, but it's more in whom I trust and with whom I relate that really matters. Open our eyes so we can see you, Lord, so we can believe and then be the witnesses of your marvelous and wonderful works. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.